Coming to you live from the Cargill booth at the Commodity Classic, I'm Kara Hart with Brownfield Ag News. We're going to continue our chat about soil health and regenerative ag here at the Commodity Classic. And uh, joining us, we've got a farmer from uh, Illinois. We've got Colby Hunt sitting right next to me. And on the far right, we've got expert Anna Teeter, a conservation agronomist with Cargill. Thank you both for joining us for this discussion. Yeah, we're going to have a really good talk. We've already had one really great Facebook Live. We're just continuing the conversation. Thank you all for joining us remotely. And thank you all here at the Commodity Classic for joining us, too. So to kick things off, Colby, uh, tell us a little bit about your farm and what you do on your farm when it comes to soil health. Okay, um, I farm in West Central Illinois um, near the Mississippi River. I farm with my dad and uncle and four cousins, and uh, we've been no-till since the early 80s. Uh, We uh, do a lot of cover crop practices, and that's kind of the beginning of it. No-till since the 1980s? That's a long time to be doing (laughs) no-till. Yeah, my grandpa went to some conference, I don't remember what it was now, and came back and said, this is something that we need to start, and within a year, we were 100%. So I bet you learned a lot of lessons if you've been doing that for 20 plus years on the farm. Well, I kind of joke that I haven't actually because we've been doing it since I came back to the farm. I went to Western Illinois University and graduated in 2003. So we've been no-tilling for a long time. So it's just a lot of refining and, and I've never tilled in my life. So it's not something I'm used to. So are you what we consider like a soil geek? Like you get out and you look at the soils and you say, oh, this looks like great soil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we dig anything up, I'm always looking at structure and earthworms and that sort of thing. Okay. So if, if, if a farmer were to go out and look at your field um, and dig up and you do like a soil test, what would we see? Um, one thing I always see, we were d- digging in a field that we'd farmed for a number of years um, just this winter. And when we dig down, the earthworm population is just insane. So, you know, earthworms are great for building soil structure and, and, you know, if you see them being healthy, you know that they're, they're doing well. And that's one maybe kind of odd gauge that we use for soil health, but um, it's one I like to use. And we were also in a field that we hadn't farmed as long and there wasn't near as many earthworms. So I, I got a good comparison this winter. Okay. The... And then you'll take that data then and just go back into the next growing season and figure out. What yeah, figure out what we could make. change to make that field that we hadn't farmed as long. What you know, what cover crop we could do or till it, non-tillage practice or whatever to try to improve the structure of that field. Well, and I don't know if you've caught it earlier, if you caught our earlier live that we did, but we also, we had a demonstration about, um, you know, soil and, and what different kinds of soil look like. Anna, do you want to talk a little bit about um, maybe what Colby is seeing on his farm, you know, in, in an, a, an agronomic perspective here and maybe yeah. what what a healthy soil looks like. Absolutely, and that's why I really love using these these slake demonstrations. We set these up earlier today, and they've been sitting here that entire time. Um, what we have in front of us, we have a conventional soil. This has been in a, in a disc till system, corn and soybean rotation. Uh, then we have the edge of the field that has not been disturbed in the last 70 years. Same field for these two, um, but this one hasn't been disturbed. This one's been disced. Then we have this one in the middle, same soil type and adjacent field. We have a cover crop no-till system. And I want you to take a moment and actually look at what you're seeing in these tubes. You'd think that they would look all the same, right? All all soil kind of acts the same. Well, even just with a short amount of practices, the difference between these two soil aggregate clumps is tremendous. First thing you're gonna notice, all of the soil that's sitting at the bottom here, all of that is eroding away as you get immense rainfall that I know a lot of you have seen even in the last couple of weeks. Um, That's that soil structure really demonstrating. If I take these two and just kind of jiggle them a little bit, you see a little bit, some bigger pieces fall. This one has fallen apart so much, there's only about half of the amount of soil that was here at the beginning. This one started at the same size as this one. It's all now sitting down in here. All of this silt and and, um, finer aggregates in this soil This is what holds your fertilizer and your nutrients. So you're watching it wash away as you continue to put more and more money in. The more that topsoil that erodes away, the more you have to spend to basically uh, recoup that cost from that soil with your fertilizer. So exactly what Colby's talking about, that aggregate stability, those uh, those blues, that soil uh, earthworm, those pores, all of that is found in these to help get water in your soil and keep that soil in place. And farmers can do a test like this on their farm, right? Absolutely, Colby, we've done it on, yeah, your, we've farm. Done it on our farm. So yeah. you do this too, what do you use for it? Uh, she was actually on our farm this summer and 
we did the same thing we did here. We pulled it in from three different locations, one that might have been more compact, uh, one that would have been had cover crops on it, and then one in conventional um, farming, pra our farming practices. So, so wh which which would you say they look like the most on in what we just saw on the demo? I mean, probably the center one where you're, you have a cover crop um, mm -hmm. and you're actively farming it year after year. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, but Colby, let's get back to some of the practices you're doing on your farm. We talk about no-till, and we talked a little bit about that, but let's focus in on cover crops, too. Tell mm -hmm. us more about your work in the cover crop scope and how you all got started there and, okay. and what you've got currently. Um, so it varies a lot year to year. Uh, we've gone where we've had a good majority of acres in cover crops, and we, we've cut back recently. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. Dad says he's been messing around. With cover crops since the late 90s um we we really kind of adopt the keep it simple like we don't do crazy mixes we don't do a lot of variety we just try to find things that work uh, on a larger scale on our farm so um it's been a lot of rye uh, a lot of and done some oats and some radishes just simple one or two um, species mixes and um, just kind of trying it in different places and different soil types and slopes and that sort of thing to find where it works. We like the joke that we've made every mistake in the book. I've got pictures of <laughs> crazy things that have gone wrong with cover crops. So. so is it a situation where you like you plant cover crops within your crop to kind of better manage the soil, the, <laughs> well, the stuff you do in the spring, or is it after you harvest? You, you... We, we've done it all. Um, we, we've hired a neighbor to follow the combines and plant as quickly as we can so that we can get growth established. We've interseeded in in season with airplanes. Um, and uh, yeah, so I got, like I said, I've got pictures of things we've done wrong. We planted into soybeans one time, oats, and had a wet fall, and we were harvesting oats with our soybeans. So it was just green coming out of the back of the combine. So we've done it all. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you're not afraid to take the risk. Um, and I know there are folks out there, other farmers that are implementing cover crops on their farm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you had to encourage folks that they were new to this, what, what would be a tip you'd share with them about, you know, trying to play with cover crops and, and figure out what worked best? I on mean, their farm? just what we've done and just keep trying it. You know, we've done it for a lot of years and seen years where that absolutely did not pay. But we believe it's the right thing for soil health. So we're going to keep trying to figure out what works on the on every farm's different you know yeah, yeah we we're blessed with some pretty good um, soil so i think that we might not see quite as easily a return on uh, organic matter and stuff because we already have really good organic matter so just everybody's going to be different it's such an interesting example because you guys have been uh, implementing these practices for so long mm -hmm. um maybe you're at a different stage than others are and it could be i i yeah yeah. I think so. So is there something about regenerative ag or a practice that you are, are looking to weave in that's new to you guys that you'd like to embrace a little bit more? What's on the horizon for you all on the farm? I don't know. I think with regenerative ag, I think we're kind of at the bleeding edge of it. And I think, you know, carbon's a place to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just excited to see what's next. I, I don't, I don't, I can't really think of anything like super new and exciting that we're thinking about trying we're just going to keep can, kind of going forward with uh, rye for the most part on our cover crops and our continue our no-till practices and uh, and just keep our eye out for what's next i'm so glad you mentioned carbon you are part of the cargill region connect program how'd you get started in that um we we uh have had a long relationship with cargill with uh specialty crops so we grow all non-gmo corn and it's marketed through their century program and uh, so, you know, we're in contact with them all the time. So they knew us and we knew them and um, they knew that we were of our conservation practices. And so they came to us and there was a lot that we liked about their program. And so we went forward with it. How long have you been part of it? Uh, this is the second year okay. that we're enrolled. I bet it was a learning curve a little bit when you got started. It is. It is. But it's a, I think carbon is a learning curve for everybody at the moment. <laughs> What do you wish that your neighbors knew about the, the carbon market or the carbon program, uh, like what you all have learned in the last two years? Um, I just, I think there's been some different opportunities out there that have scared people off of carbon, long-term contracts, um, scared of giving up data. And I just would, I guess I would, my encouragement would be just look out for, just interview everyone, see what you like, 
if what fits for your operation. How did you all feel about the technology piece of it? I mean, it sounds like you all are embracing all of that. So where does where does that shift in your mind, the technology piece? As far as signing up goes? Yeah, as far as signing yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, you just got to make it as easy as possible if you want to get people to participate. And uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. Anna, can you walk us through some of the process with Region Connect and what it's like for growers to you know sign up and be part of it, enhancing a little bit about what we've talked with Colby? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, one thing that we love to brag about our program is how simple and easy it is to get enrolled in our program. Um, you know, w with most other programs, you're looking at maybe a, a 40 or 60 hour commitment for enrollment. And, you know, I, I, I know the hunts did not spend that much time enrolling in this program. Um, depending on the size of your operation will change how much time you spend on it. But when you're looking at this program, uh, you're going to be putting in some of your crop history, what your intentions are that you want to do in this program, and then whether or not you actually did the practices. So we're really trying to limit the data that we're asking for producers and just making sure we're getting the information that we actually need to get verified and qualified carbon credits. And then on the producer side, so essentially you work with Cargill, you get signed up, and then what happens? Yeah, so when a producer signs up with our program, um, the first thing we're going to do is go in and make sure you got those practices completed, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're paying farmers and what they're doing. But uh, our program, we're split up into two payments. So we have a first half payment that comes right after uh, those practices are implemented. Our growers are getting their first payments if they signed up last year right now. Um, and then about a year after that, they get their, their second half payment uh, after we true up what actually happened in the field. And so producers are actually getting money. Uh, getting money now and getting it much earlier than they are in a lot of other programs. Was there anything about the process that we haven't talked about, Colby, that you think other growers may be interested in knowing if they were uh, to sign up for something like this? Um, to be completely honest with you about the process, that we have a number of members in our organization. We all have our own very defined roles. So I didn't actually do the signing up of uh, Cargill. My cousin did. So, um, But from what I reported, I think he, or from what I heard, I think he had one or two hours in getting our farm signed up. So, and we've had some um, cat hangups along the way that we've worked through that didn't work hard at all. We had really great people to work with. Well, when you farm with your family and you have people that are all invested in, in one goal, it sounds like you can really accomplish a lot. Yeah, we have very uh, defined roles on our farm. So there's a lot of areas that I don't know very much about, so. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share about some of the practices that you do on your farm? Colby, anything else you think folks here need to know about soil health, regenerative agriculture? And once we get through Colby, I'll circle back with Anna here, see if okay. she has anything to add. Um, is there anything that I should bring up? <laughs> I can't think of anything. Okay. Anna, is there anything else you want to add? Well, and I think, Colby, you'll agree with this. I mean, you're doing it for the long-term benefit, right? You want to have farmland that you're going to be able to use for a long period of time. And that's why Cargill's focusing on our regenerative um, Regen Connect program, right? We really want to make sure that we are able to source grain from producers like Colby over the next couple of generations and doing it in a way that's simple and accessible to farmers. Yeah, and I guess that I could kind of sound off that where um, we've gone into a lot of situations with these practices that we've got to the end of the year and said, well, that just didn't pay. But we know that in the long term, it's it's what's good for the field. So so what kind of ROI is an investment like this for you guys? Uh, not very much a lot of times. As far as like a, a yield or a return on investment directly, um, directly from the cover, say the cover crop practice, um, we have not seen much you know, year to year, like if you plant cover crop and then do a yield analysis at the end of the year, you might not see it then, but I think it's a 10 year thing. So like not a sprint, but a marathon it's kind a marathon. of situation. Yes, very much so. Soil health, a, 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 a marathon, not a sprint. Yes. So, well, thank you guys so much for joining us and thank you all for joining us. Thanks everyone. If you're tuning in here at the Commodity Classic or if you're tuning in online, we're glad you could join us here. We are at the Cargill booth at the Commodity Classic and I've been visiting with Colby Hunt. He's a farmer from Illinois and we've also got uh, Anna Teeter, a conservation agronomist with Cargill. And be sure to join us. This is not our final discussion at Classic. We've got one more and uh, we'll be coming to you live on Friday or if you're tuning in online or tuning in after the Commodity Classic, come back, join us for uh, a recorded video uh, and we'll be sure to have more information about soil health and regenerative ag. I'm Kara Hart for Brownfield reporting to you from the Commodity Classic.